Hi everybody, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Werner Pöwe. It's a great pleasure to be part of this virtual program. Um, I've been invited to say a few words about infusion therapies and novel drug delivery for Parkinson's disease. And as you can see from the title of my presentation, I'm intending to speak about new modes of delivery, but for old drugs. What do I mean by old drugs? Um, basically, I want to speak about levodopa and then also a little bit about apomorphine in terms of infusion and of drug delivery. Levodopa is a truly, to this very day, revolutionary drug for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, Arvid Carlson, the pharmacologist from Sweden, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2000, more than 20 years ago now, for his seminal work showing that in rabbits that were made akinetic, immobile through an agent that depletes dopamine, reserpine, that these animals could be brought back to full mobility and activity by levodopa. He did not, in his work, uh, translate this to human conditions. And uh, the way towards this was paved by Ole Honikiewicz from Vienna, a pharmacologist whom for the first time convincingly showed that in the brain of subjects that had succumbed to Parkinson's disease, there was indeed severe dopamine depletion. And he then set out to do with his neurological colleague, Birk Meyer, experiments with levodopa in patients with Parkinson's. And the effects were truly dramatic. And it was George Kotsias, though, in the United States who brought this to worldwide acceptance by supplying large doses of oral levodopa to his patients and um, demonstrating remarkable recovery. These were the pioneers and this all happened in the late 1950s and the 1960s. And to this very day, levodopa is the most efficacious agent still to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. There's nothing that quite parallels it with the exception of apomorphine that I will mention a little later. Problem with levodopa is that many, many subjects after many years of treatment will then unfortunately develop what we call motor complications to levodopa, response fluctuations and drug-induced dyskinesias. Um, the frequency of these problems, the severity um, varies from study to study. And there are certain risk factors that determine if or not someone gets into trouble with these types of problems. Age is one important factor. The younger, the more likely patients are to develop, in particular, drug-induced dyskinesias. The dose is important. The higher the dose, the greater the risk. The disease duration is important. Patients themselves rate these issues very highly. And although drug-induced involuntary movements can be very conspicuous for patients, for subjects, for sufferers from Parkinson's, it's the fluctuation in motor response, the switching between on and off, between mobility and recurring Parkinsonism with trembling and also non-motor symptoms, makes these off periods very, very unpleasant and they're ranked up very highly when patients are asked to list the uh, symptoms that they find the most troublesome fluctuating response comes up very, very much at the top. The different types of fluctuations that I will not be able to go into in any detail. The most common type is where symptoms of Parkinsonism, motor and non-motor, re-emerge towards the end of an interval between two, do two doses, and we call this wearing off uh, response. But there are also unpredictable swings that are not easily explained by their relationship to the timing of levodopa doses. There are even doses that just don't work. They fail or doses that take unusually long to kick in. And all this relates to a number of factors around the levodopa pharmacokinetics and transport. Levodopa is a short half-life drug with only uh, 90 minutes half-life. So alone by this, there have to be fluctuations in plasma levels as multiple daily doses, three or four are taken. Uh, levels rise and fall multiple times during the day. But there are other issues related to gastric emptying. Parkinson uh, sufferers frequently have problems with gastric motility, delayed gastric emptying. Levodopa will not be absorbed as, as long as it is in the stomach. It has to be 
uh, transported further down into the gut and the major absorption site of levodopa is in the proximal jejunum. And here again, there are potential interferences with uh, the amino acids, protein components from the diet that will again potentially interfere with levodopa even entering the bloodstream. Similar processes of competition between amino acids and levodopa occur at the blood-brain barrier. So multiple factors that are important for the development of motor fluctuations and this is where infusion therapy uh, comes in. Um, I've called this uh, this period here, the golden 1980s, and that is in relation to um, infusion therapies. There were a number of seminal pilot studies published in the 1980s. One was by the group around Andrew Lees and Gerald Stern in London, who showed that by intravenous infusions, constant rate infusions during the daytime, patients that had bad fluctuations in their motor response could be maintained fully on over many, many hours. Problem was it required high volumes of fluid to keep levodopa in solution. Levodopa is a poorly soluble drug and the resulting solution was fairly acid and aggressive. So there was a need for central catheters put into the uh, subclavian vein. So nothing that was practically feasible for an everyday type of treatment. Or some years later, American authors showed that the same kind of spectacular result with continuous delivery of levodopa could be obtained by giving it through the gut to in via nasogastric uh, tubes um, and do denal infusions of large volumes again. Um, that this works in a similarly well, similarly good fashion compared to the intravenous infusions. Both these approaches were hampered by the large fluid volumes needed. And this did kick off and didn't become a practical treatment then in the 1980s, which was different for the other old drug, apomorphine, which was shown here in that seminal paper, again by the Stern Lees group, to be able to revert Parkinsonism motor, Parkinsonian motor fluctuations when given subcutaneously by an infusion pump. And this immediately, at least in Europe, translated into an uptake in clinical routine, while for infusions with uh, um, levodopa itself, it took almost 20 years before a solution was found to um, formulate levodopa such that it would become amenable in small manageable volumes in a gel formulation to inter jejunal, intraduodenal, intrajejunal delivery. A minimally invasive procedure though, because it does require placement of a PEG tube with um, through the abdominal wall uh, via the stomach into the uh, gut, into the intestine, but very well demonstrated in terms of efficacy by double blind randomized control trials, which for apomorphine also took a long time in terms of showing the effect that was observed in the 1980s in the framework of a, of a randomized control trial, which was only done recently. And speaking about old drugs, um, giving them a, a new whole new meaning through new ways of delivery, there are still quote unquote tricks that are relatively easy to further optimize this. And one is shown here on this slide, which is but that adding a COMT inhibitor something we do routinely in, in oral adjunct therapy in Parkinson's disease. By doing so, the uh, levels of levodopa can be moved up or higher in blood, meaning that smaller volumes to be infused are required. And this has an immediate impact on the pump system by reducing the volumes needed through adding entacapone to this solution, to this formulation, the volumes go down, the pump size and the pump weight goes down by 50% or so, which is convenient for those people with Parkinson's disease that do need and that do benefit from these kinds of infusions. So again, a small trick with old known pharmacological principles leading to improvement. But of course, one would like to get away in terms of levodopa infusions from the minimally invasive procedure requiring a uh, um, placement of a PEG tube, i.e. going through the abdominal wall um, into the stomach and 
the gut. And there are at least two advanced, fairly advanced clinical development programs with subcutaneous delivery of levodopa using new formulations, one by Neuroderm and Mitsubishi and the other by Abvi. And from the slide here, you see how nicely plasma levels can be kept constant with infusing levodopa subcutaneously compared to the ups and downs we see in oral treatment. As a paper recently published of a phase, small phase two trial with this particular um, formulation for subcutaneous delivery, showing that indeed this given either around the clock or for 16 hours of, uh, of a waking day that these uh, subcutaneous infusions do significantly reduce often increase on time. But there's another reverse, in a way, reverse problem or need for delivering, for alternative delivery ways of levodopa and apomorphin, and that's for subjects who need to come out of an off period as quickly and as conveniently as possible, i.e. to have on-demand, rapid onset of effect formulations. And there has been progress in this, fortunately, with two drugs or two approaches that have uh, been approved by the FDA, one also by the EMA in Europe. This is the one that has been approved by both regulating uh, bodies uh, in inhaled powder formulation of levodopa that indeed is able to revert subjects back to full on in a short period of time. The primary outcome here in this trial was 30 minutes, but as you can see from these curves, this is 20 minutes, 10 minutes. These these in inhaled formulations work very, very rapidly, are rapidly um, taken up by the blood and levodopa blood levels are, are produced. And that is a convenient way to help and on, a, on an on-demand basis, basis to get out of off periods. And this can also be achieved with apomorphine, which currently for many years has been given as subcutaneous bolus injections with using a pen injector and on an on-demand as needed basis to revert off periods. But here now is a sublingual formulation that also recently has been approved for use in Parkinson's by the FDA and again has shown been shown in this trial to work and reliably uh, work rapidly and reliably reduce or abort off periods. This is not all that is happening around these old drugs, particularly for levodopa. This slide is only here to show you there are multiple novel oral formulations in different phases of clinical development. One uh, principle, for example, using small micro tablets and a dispenser uh, taken multiple times, many, many times a day to, to kind of mimic continuous delivery has received EMA approval and is available in Sweden, for example. But others are in different phases of, of development. So after so many years, levodopa is still actively developed. And finally, this is not the end. The other end of the extreme, if you want, uh, in terms of invasiveness is to try and modify the brain machinery for dopamine synthesis to deliver through gene therapy the key steps, the key molecules, the key enzymes of levodopa synthesis. For example, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. That's been a, a principle that has been studied for at least 10 years now. And they are recently uh, encouraging phase one results with this approach. And there's ongoing work also with multiple enzymes delivered through viral vectors. So not, not just the final step of conversion dop of dopa to dopamine, but also enzymes that would lead to the synthesis of L-dopa itself in the brain uh, by delivering additional enzymes, either three here in this approach or two in this experimental work. So here is more to expect for novel delivery of dopamine indirectly through synthesizing enzymes that are put into the brain through viral vectors and surgery. So summarizing, the, the good old levodopa remains the gold standard. It's still the best drug in terms of efficacy for the treatment of motor symptoms. It's only parallel by apomorphine. Um, levodopa motor complications are a limiting factor due mainly to discontinuity and discontinuous drug delivery. And the approaches I've shown you are all there to, with different, in different ways, help to 
um, improve that that delivery um, through different routes, infusions and on-demand therapies. And we're seeing still development ongoing with oral formulations. There's room for improvement in the pump technology. We're all hoping to see the development of mini patch pump-like devices that would be similar to those used in insulin treatment for diabetes. And we'll wait and see based on these encouraging results from early phase gene therapy where that will lead us. Thank you very much for your attention and listening.